Welcome, dearly beloved, to our celebration of Pentecost this day in our church with our organist. Our order of service, which will follow today, will be Matins on page 219. But before we begin Matins, we're going to turn in our hymn book to our opening hymn, hymn number 498 in the Lutheran service book, and hymn number 233 in the old Lutheran hymnal, and that is hymn Number 498, Come Holy Ghost, Creator Blessed. on page 219. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship Him. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the 
Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship Him. We will be using Psalm 143 today in our hymn book, Psalm 143. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness answer me. In your righteousness, enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued my soul, he has crushed my life to the ground, he has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore my spirit faints within me, my heart within me is appalled. I remember the days of old, I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands, I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness bring my soul out of trouble, and in your steadfast love you will cut off my enemies, and you will destroy all the adversaries of my soul. For I am your servant. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We'll sing now our office hymn, hymn number 704 in your Lutheran service book, or hymn number 398 in the TLH. Hymn 704, Renew Me, O Eternal Light. The Old Testament lesson for Pentecost comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. 
Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there, uh, down and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. The second reading today comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Our final reading comes from St. John's Gospel, the 14th chapter, beginning at verse 23. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. 
we sing the common responsory on page 221. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where At this time, we normally collect the offering, and if you'd like to make an offering to our church during these times, you can do so uh, by e-transfer to ZL Yorkton at sastel.net. The email address will be listed below. But we hear now our sermon text for Pentecost, which comes from Acts chapter 2. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is our text. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Wherever man has gathered at the end of a day's toil, it has been around a fire. From hunters and gatherers to people warming themselves before the age of electricity, I mean... People have fireplaces in their home they still gather around. And I think of the summer camp kids who would normally be gathered around a fire, drinking some hot chocolate at the end of a long day. We always gather around the fire. And for those of you who remember the stories of the Old Testament, fire is one of those primordial images of God that the Bible gives us, an image of God's presence. God appears like a fire in the book of Genesis during the ceremonial making of the covenant with Abraham. In the fires of the burning bush, we glimpse the presence of God in Exodus, and God led his people out of slavery with a pillar of fire, which then came to rest over the tabernacle, the place, the tent, where Moses met with God, and at which the people of God worshipped. It is as if God knows and loves man and sees that we gather around fires, and so he shows up to be there with us, too. We have a God who is relational, who loves us. Fire is a fearful image. It purifies. It is dangerous and yet cleansing. But for most of human history, it was the only source of light in the darkness. It is how we cook and stay warm and how we survive. There is a fear in fire, but there is mostly gift. It was a fearful thing to go into the presence of God in the scriptures. And in the Old Testament, the people offered sacrifice after sacrifice before entering. And still, there was fear. We don't get that in Pentecost. For the Christians gathered at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended, no one died in the fire. No one was consumed in the wrath of God, there was fire, but it was the warmth and the comfort and the strength and the purity of fire, none of the fear. Was it because the disciples were that much more holy than the saints of the Old Testament? Unlikely. What we remember at Pentecost, of course, is what immediately preceded. It is Easter. It is the gift of Christ's sacrifice, which he offered for our sins and Christ's sacrifice, which was without blemish. It was the perfect sacrifice so that the disciples could be sure that their sins were covered with the immaculate righteousness of Christ so that when God looked at them despite their sins, they were seen as Christ himself, perfectly holy. And so the Spirit of God and the appearance of tongues of fire rests upon them and they are not harmed. They become the tabernacles. They become the temples of God's presence because they are entirely acceptable to God. God sits at the campfire 
with, with them as it were in them. At the baptism of our Lord, the Holy Spirit could be seen descending upon Jesus, signaling that he was the one chosen by God the Father with the mission of carrying out our salvation. The Spirit descends and Jesus preaches. His kingdom expands and the same thing happens with the church. At Pentecost, Jesus commissions and sends his church likewise to go out into the world and to proclaim the mighty works of God in every language by God's almighty power, and the Spirit descends on them, too. Now, we heard a story from the Old Testament that was kind of the opposite of Pentecost. It was the story of Babel, and it shows us what happened when mankind, you know, after the fall, they reject the mission that God has given them. God tells them to go and spread out over the earth, and it was as though humanity who had rejected God's presence at the campfire in Eden, humanity, who had decided to go it alone, was now saying, no, we'll just stay in this spot. We'll unite against God and have our own party. We'll worship ourselves here. Well, when man unites sinfully for a common purpose against God, they are confounded. The languages are confused. No one beats God. But in the Acts of the Apostles, we see the opposite, right? We see the good side. God gathers his disparate peoples and he develops, uh, he displays his presence by tongues of fire. Believers from all over to be united in one purpose. Once more united in the mission of Jesus this time. For through his spirit, Jesus Christ acts in his church, in his people, in you and me. At the Incarnation, God the Son took up a human nature. The divine nature and the human nature are united in one person. And at Pentecost, the body of Christ, Christ's baptized believers, are brought up into the heavenly life of the Holy Spirit in some special way. And it's as if when we are brought into the fire of the Spirit, all distinction melts away and we are one. The prophecies of the Old Testament, speaking of the day of Pentecost, bear witness to the Holy Spirit being poured out on all flesh. And so Pentecost means that all of us can be included, that God's Spirit is busy seeking out, calling, and moving people of every tribe, every tongue, every nation to belong to Jesus Christ. It's telling that Jesus directed his disciples uh, it, it is telling, it's interesting, that Jesus directs his disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit, to wait for power from on high before they go on in their mission. And that's important for us. Another lesson of Pentecost, it shows that the growth of the church is actually the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not the work of man. We would be powerless to convert anyone, to bring the good news to one soul without the Holy Spirit. Some American revivalists famously committed this awful blasphemy by declaring that they were such good preachers uh, that they could convert people without the Holy Spirit, just by their own words, just by their own cleverness. And unfortunately today in the church, that's the attitude. People have largely forgotten the Holy Spirit and his purpose. And so people think evangelism, they think the growth of the church is just sales techniques where the missionary wins over the person with their charisma or their clever arguments. But the Bible tells us that the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And our small catechism reminds us of this, right? I believe that I cannot believe by my own reason or strength in Jesus Christ my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Ghost has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gift, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. So the point is that again, Pentecost, the growth of the church is God's work. It is God, the Holy Spirit, working in and through us. So Pentecost shows us how God does this. It shows us God's gracious demeanor towards us as well. It shows us his love and his mercy in seeking us out who deserve nothing but punishment for our many sins. Pentecost shows that we Gentiles, can be grafted into Israel, that we are a part of God's people now, and all of the promises of God become ours by the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this global grace, this global vision which encapsulates every nation. And that's why we send missionaries as a church. That's why we translate the Bible. That's why we share the good news 
Not because we want other people to be like us or to think like us, but because God has included them in his plan and mission and purpose. And we are called to proclaim that good news. Pentecost also tells us how the church is to preach and to hear preaching. Did you catch it? Uh, it tells us the focus of worship was that the people were telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. It's the mighty works of God that are emphasized in preaching. It teaches us that the Holy Spirit works through the proclamation of the gospel, through preaching what God has done, whether that is in church, whether that is on the radio, or even here to you now through the internet. Wherever the word of God is proclaimed, the spirit of Christ is busily at work in us. I often think of the preaching of the word like the Christmas Eve service where we all gather and we have our little candles and the word goes out and it passes from person to person. And as we share and confess Christ in our world, we do the same thing. We continue spreading the fire of his presence, the light of the gospel. One thing I must confess asking in seminary at Pentecost, it always kind of confused me and rattled me, was, Professor, when did the Holy Spirit come to the apostles? When did the apostles get the Holy Spirit? Was it when they heard the call of Christ and answered in faith? Or was it when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit in John 20? Or was it at Pentecost? Yes, was the answer. And that is because the Holy Spirit continually fills us. The Holy Spirit is in one sense like the gas in our tank, the coal and the fire of our faith. We need to be constantly refilled and renewed. We sing and pray year after year for the Holy Spirit to come upon us, to fill us. And the pattern of the apostolic church sees multiple fillings, multiple moments in time when the Holy Spirit dramatically acts in the life of a person. And St. Paul tells the baptized church to be filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5.18, and he uses the present tense. It is ongoing. That's why the Catechism speaks of it continually happening daily and richly in our lives. And as if this wasn't all too much to digest already, one last point we get about the Holy Spirit is its permanence, the permanence of the work of the Holy Spirit. Of God's elect, St. Paul writes that they are sealed with the Holy Spirit. They are stamped, they are embossed, they are imprinted with God's seal. As we are marked with the name of the Holy Trinity in baptism, the Holy Spirit marks us with a lasting seal, showing that we belong to God. In ancient times, kings and noblemen would have a familial seal that they would put, with, they would put some wax over the fire of the candle. And they would stamp into the wax their seal. The seal on a letter served as proof of ownership, as a proof that they authored it, that they approved of it. Our faith is the letter God has written and enclosed in the envelope of each one of us. The fire of the Holy Spirit melts the wax of our sinful rebellion so that God stamps his seal upon us. So that we belong to Christ because we are his precious cargo, the very vessels in which he himself travels and works. Dearly beloved, as you hear these words in faith, you can know that you belong to Christ, that you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, that you are on the team, that however alone you may feel, that God sits at the fire with you. He lives in your hearts. And you are a part of his mission. You are a bearer of God. Even at home, watching this live stream, God is present in you and with you to lead you in the vocation he has given you. And he sends you out today as his people, all because of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. We continue in our worship. Instead of our canticle, we will turn to hymn number 685. We'll sing hymn number 685 as uh, a hymn here. Uh, in the TLH, it will be number 409. And that hymn is, Let Us Ever Walk With Jesus.
Let us pray with the Kyrie on page 227. our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Let us pray. of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day, to, our day by the same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For all baptized believers, that they would be given ears to hear and an eagerness to learn all that the Holy Spirit teaches them about their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the salvation they have through him. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For spiritual renewal in our congregation, our region, and our synod, and the whole church on earth, that by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, we would long to keep Christ's word, dwell in his peace, sing God's praises, and love our neighbors. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace among the nations, for those who rule over us, for those who protect and defend us, and for liberty, that the peoples of our world would be blessed to live in health, peace, and quietness, unhindered by threats of violence, oppression, or fear, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For an end to the pandemic, for those afflicted in body and spirit, and especially for those who have requested our prayers, especially for that their hearts would neither be troubled nor afraid, for nothing can separate them from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, who has overcome the ruler of this world, and secured for them eternal peace in his kingdom, which has no end. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who have gone before us and now rest from their labors, let us give thanks to the Lord that we would follow them as they followed Christ and be found faithful by those who come after us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. All this we ask in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governments may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you 